Well, what's up, Abundant Life? If you have a copy of God's Word, why don't you find the book of Hebrews? Chapter 13 is where we're going to be at this morning. We are finishing our line-by-line study through the book of Hebrews, and hopefully you've learned some things as we've taken a deep dive into this wonderful book that has so many layers, that is such a great uh, key to unlock so much of the meaning of the Old Testament, that Hebrews is a a New Testament commentary on a lot of the Old Testament, and I'm so excited to be able to finish Hebrews chapter 13 with you this morning, and uh, I don't know what you've brought in here this morning, but I'm excited that you made the decision to get here. And what we've been saying all along through this this series, if you're just now joining us, is simply that Jesus is better. This is the anthem of the author of the book of Hebrews. And he's been pointing us to these different images in the Old Testament saying, man, those are just shadows that point to the substance that is in Christ. And and now we're finishing uh, all of this like teaching on Jesus is better. And we're getting to this final chapter, and basically, it's, it's much like a sermon finishes at any of our locations. It's, it's much like the plane has been landed, and we've had a response song, so to speak, and the, the author of Hebrews has stepped back out on the stage, so to speak, and he says, well, every time the Word of God is preached, it demands a response, so what is your next step? We say a lot of times at Abundant Life that everyone has the next step. We'll ask this question, what is your next step? We've even built things around the language of going to first steps and then you go to next steps class. We have a next steps desk at all of our campuses, at church houses, the church house leader. They usually turn uh, the conversation after each session or after each message and in time that y'all have church together and say, hey, what is God speaking to you and what are you gonna do about it? Because they're interested in you taking your next step. And and the question I have for all of us this morning is simply that, what is your next step? That's really what we're gonna see this morning. What is your next step? We're gonna see many, many applications to what we've been studying over the last 12 chapters. If you're taking notes, I've titled the message this morning, what is your next step? (laughs) What is your next step? And we're gonna look at next steps that you need to take in your home. We're gonna look at next steps that you can take at church. And before we leave this morning, we're gonna talk about taking our next steps by faith. So we're at the end of Hebrews, and and just to catch you up, last week we talked about how God has given us this invitation to be a part of Mount Zion. He said, I got two mountains, Mount Sinai, which represents you trying to earn your salvation, which you can't, or Mount Zion, which represents you receiving the covenant of grace, that, that you can be a part of the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. And he says that this is a kingdom that we are receiving that cannot be shaken. And hopefully last week, if you were with us, you got a little fired up about the gift that God has that he's offering to you and I. And he says the fitting response, once we receive this kingdom that cannot be shaken, he says, man, we need to worship. And I love this because worship always precedes our work for God. That worship, oftentimes, it fuels our work for God. Do you ever wonder like why we come into this space and why we sing first? <laughs> the many times the reason why we sing first is because it postures our heart and it readies us to receive the word of God because we've turned our attention to the glory of God and now we're ready to receive the word of God so that we can go live the way of God, amen? And so that's what's happening. He says, man, in chapter 12 at the end, we've received this kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let's worship. And then he turns a corner out of that. And here's what he says in chapter 13, starting in verse one. He says, let brotherly love continue. Again, he's talking about next steps. He's saying, this is what you need to do in light of Jesus is better, in light of the kingdom that you've received that cannot be shaken. He says, let brotherly love continue. He's like, I've seen this in you, but let it continue. Then he gives some handles to it. He says, and do not forget, verse two, do not forget to entertain strangers. Now let me pause real quick. Uh, Entertain, that that doesn't mean like that you have strangers over to your house and and you hire a band and you watch Nate Bargetsy and you laugh. You know what I'm saying? That's not what he's saying, all right? Entertain, it, it can literally mean hospitality. So some of your translations say that you need to be hospitable to strangers. He says, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. This is a call back to Genesis and Abraham and him entertaining angels when he welcomed some strangers into his house. He goes on in verse three, he says this, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Uh, remember, it, it, kinda, it connotates not that you're just like, oh, I remember that that person is locked up. It, it's, it's more like you need to go do something when you remember them. Uh, in this culture, if you were in prison, you didn't have a, a whole system that was providing for you. If you were in prison, you didn't eat unless someone brought you food. And what he's talking about in particular are are Christians who are in prison for their faith. And he's saying, man, don't forget about those folks. And you need to remember them and you need to take it a step further and you need to care for them. He goes on, he says this in verse four, 
or excuse me, he says, yeah, in verse four, he says this, in marriage, it is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, I, I, I love this because he turns a corner. He's talking about how letting brotherly love continue. And he talks about how you need to be hospitable. You need to remember those who are in prison. And then he gets real personal. And he says that your next steps of your faith, your faith should play itself out. And he's about to give us another category. The first category is it, it should play out in your sex life. And the second category, it should play out in the way that you see money. I mean, these are really, really big categories in our life that we oftentimes have a hard time living out our faith, but the word of God is gonna speak into those. And again, he says, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And then he goes on in verse five and he says this, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. This is where he's talking about our material things. And then it reminds us of some profound promises. He says, for he himself has said, I love this verse, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a great promise from God. And then he goes on in verse six, he says, so we, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Point number one, if you're taking notes this morning, you can write this down, next steps at home. Next steps at home. Man, the preacher or the author, he is rattling off a list of next steps and he's starting very simple. He's starting very practical. He's saying to his audience, like, like you need to let the love that God has put in you, that I've seen in you, you need to let it continue and you need to allow it to filter and infiltrate into your home. See, your relationship with Jesus, if you don't know this, your relationship with Jesus, it should impact the way you live at home. If your faith doesn't take its place in your home, you've misunderstood how far reaching your faith should be. Listen, God wants to change your home and he starts off in this section by saying, let brotherly love continue. So if you're taking notes, if you wanna take a next step at home, here's something that you can do today. You can do this by the end of the day. You can just simply love more. You can love more. Man, the love of God, it should mark all of us and we should love more. We should grow and increase in our love. Like what would it look like for you to love a little bit more in your home this week? What would it look like as a result of coming here today for you to take a next step and give a little bit more love to the people in your home and a little bit more love to the people in your neighborhood? Now, love is a, a very broad term and it can mean a lot of different things, but the author of Hebrews, he gets real specific and he says, let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by letting this love continue. And the first way he says that you can love more by hosting people. Again, right there in verse two, he says, man, you need to entertain strangers. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you had somebody at your house that you really didn't know very well? Like when was the last time that you hosted somebody for dinner or, or man, it's fall. This is a great time of the year to do hospitable things. You can be outside in the front yard this time of year and not be sweating your face off. You know what I'm saying? You can, you could take some pumpkin bread because that's what we do in the Midwest. We go to pumpkin patches and we eat pumpkin things and you can take some pumpkin bread to your neighbor and say, Hey, I made my version of pumpkin bread and you can give it to them and say, what's your name? And you get to know your neighbors. Uh, you, you could have a chief's watch party in the backyard, you know, because because your neighbors are already watching the game and so you just have them all come together and y'all can all, you know, like be grateful that the referees are on our side, amen, you know? And you can just slap hands and be like, I know, I know, it was past interference, but we got away with it, praise God, right? And you could do that together with your neighbors. Like, do you even know your neighbors' names? Like, do you know the people that live around you? And are you hospitable towards them? This doesn't mean that you always have to have somebody over for dinner. This means that you have vision that I'm gonna love more by serving the people around me. Man, we have a couple of pastors on our staff, Pastor Kyle Worsham, who's over all of our church houses and on our online campus, and then a guy named Pastor Mark McGoy, and these guys are incredible at hospitality. If you wanna grow in your ability to be able to be hospitable to the people in your neighborhood, you should send Kyle Worsham or Mark McGoy an email this week, and they could give you a masterclass on how to live out verse two. And if we're gonna love more, man, we need to take a next step in our hospitality or entertaining of the people around us. Another handle that he gives us on how to love more is he says, man, you can help people. You can help people. Again, in verse three, he says, man, you gotta remember those who are prisoners and you, got, you, don't, you don't need to forget them. What does this look like practically in, in our life? 
A couple of years ago, um, we partnered with a ministry called Compassion International. And what we did is we said, man, we want to go all in into a community in Peru, and we want to help... Uh, we want to help move the needle to provide for people that don't have basic things like what we have. And, and so, man, it's been incredible. What we've done as a family is that we have sponsored, or the language we use in our, at our tables, that we've adopted Annalie, Leslie, and Brianna, or Brianna. And we pray for Annalie, Leslie, and Brianna almost every day. Just even a couple of days ago, my oldest daughter, Lydia, she's 12. She's writing a letter to the, the little girl that's about her age that we've sponsored or that we've adopted. And we don't have prisoners, so to speak, that we can go and take meals to, but there are people that are in a prison of poverty or there are people that are in a prison of difficulty that we can love more, that we can help them out. And so you could do this across the world or you could also just, I mean, you could get involved with things like what we have at Abundant Life. There's a ministry that we partner with called the Care Portal where you can provide for basic needs in the community, you can reach out to our Live Scent department and you can figure out who are the people in our community in the KC Metro that are experiencing difficulty that I can serve, that I can help out, that I can do something for them. But what if a next step as a result of you coming this morning is that you begin to love more by identifying someone who is in need and providing for that need? We're talking about loving more. We're talking about taking a next step at your home. And what we've said is that the word of God is saying, man, you can do that tangibly by hosting people, by helping people. Well, here's a, another way that you can do that, by honoring marriage. I mean, he says in verse four, again, he turns a corner, he says, man, you need to have a biblical view of marriage. He says that marriage is to be honorable among all. Now, if you're single here, don't check out, all right? This is really not meant to just be just for the married people. This is meant to be for all people. And what he's dealing with specifically is our sexual purity. And he says that he uses marriage as a way to get into this conversation. He says marriage is supposed to be honored among all people. That marriage is the place, that marriage is, is between one man and one woman. They're coming together for life. And that is the place where sexual expression takes place. And anything outside of that is, is perverted and is not God's plan. And he says, but if you're married, man, it, the marriage bed is undefiled. And, and so like the good news is, is that God is not sexually repressed. He's not against your sexual fulfillment. He just wants the fire in the fireplace, amen? Because if the fire gets out of the fireplace, then it's gonna burn the whole house down, you know what I'm saying? And so he wants the fire in the fireplace and the fire should be good. The fire should be hot. The fire should be enjoyable, amen? You know what I'm saying? And so he, that, but he's saying that's where it needs to belong, and the reason why we know that he's talking about this in particular is because he says this. He says, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. What he's doing is he's saying, man, marriage is something where the gospel should impact greatly. And that anytime we fornicate or we commit adultery, we tarnish God's great gift. See, if you don't know this, man, the gospel, your relationship with Jesus, it should impact the most intimate places in your home. It should be far reaching, even into the most intimate places of your home. And the reason why we know that he's not just talking to married people is because he uses the word fornicator and adulterer. Uh, the word fornicator, it really insinuates that you're not married. It, it's uh, the Greek word pornos, which we get our word pornography from. And it's anyone that does anything sexually uh, that's, that's not in God's will. And then adulterer is really relegated to somebody that's married and they're committing sex outside of the confines of their marriage. And so what he's saying is like, man, you need to allow the gospel to impact your sexual purity. And we're talking about taking next steps at home. And what would it look like if you begin to view marriage as honorable, as God's gift, so much so that you understood that when you're looking at pornography, if you're looking at pornography, or when you're watching sexually explicit things on Netflix or Hulu or wherever you watch, that you would, you would feel this at your conscience and say, man, this is not something that I should be looking at. This is something that I need to give over to the Lord and sacrifice so that I can be pure in my sexual conduct. See, if you believe that Jesus is better and that he has changed your life, it should impact the most intimate places of your life. And maybe a next step for you is seeing marriage the way that God sees it. Maybe a next step for you is, is enjoying the marriage that God has given you in a new way. Maybe a next step for you is, is getting sexually pure. Well, he, he turns out of this and then he moves from a very personal and somewhat uh, uncomfortable conversation to another very personal and uncomfortable conversation. He moves from sex to money and he says this in verse five, he says, man, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. And so if we're gonna take next steps at home, not only do we need to love more, but we need to choose to live content. We gotta live content. 
man, contentment is so challenging in our society. I mean, for us to choose to be content, you know, content says, I have enough. Content is like, man, there's still a few chicken nuggets on the plate, but I'm good. I don't need to eat them all. You know what I'm saying? Content says, I, I, not only do I have enough, but contentment says, I am enough. But there are a couple of enemies of contentment that are so pervasive in our society. One of them he calls out is covetousness. That's you looking at other people's stuff and saying, I want that. That's what covetousness is. And covetousness's kissing cousin is comparison. You know, many of us at home, you know, the things that we do is we get off of work, you know, and we come home and, and we sit down and we pull out our phone and we look at Instagram or Facebook and we just get so filled with contentment, don't we? You know, it's just our daily dose of, ah. Oh. No, that's not what happens, isn't it crazy? We'll spend so much time scrolling and just feeling dissatisfied and discontent. It's like, why do we do this to ourselves? Like, oh, they're in Disney World, praise God. We're so happy for you, you know? <laughs> oh, 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 wow, wow. She, she's 50, wow, she looks 18, wow, that's amazing, good for her. She must have had some work done, you know? Like, you just, <laughs> you know, and, and, then your, and then your camera turns on and you get a glimpse of yourself like this, you know, looking like, oh, my goodness, right? <laughs> and, uh, and why do we do that? And, and it's, it's feeding something inside of us. It's feeding covetousness and comparison. And listen, comparison, it kills. And covetousness, it kills contentment. But we're called this morning to take a next step at home, to live out our faith at the home level. And what if, what if we quit feeding covetousness? What if we quit feeding comparison and we, we took God at his word that says in 1 Timothy 6 that godliness plus contentment equals great gain? And what if we made a decision this morning as a result of listening to God's word and choosing that Jesus is better, that we would take a next step in choosing contentment over covetousness and over comparison. But how do we do that? Again, this is so difficult. Well, here's a couple of things that the author gives us right here in this section on how to be content. And really this could apply on how to be sexually pure as well. He reminds us with a couple of unblemishing promises from God. He, he says this, how can you live content? Well, here's one promise. You've got God's presence, man. <laughs> You've got God with you. And so you don't need that new thing or all of those things in order to be a thing. You've got God in your life, man. That's what makes you somebody. That God will never leave you nor forsake you. Another thing, another promise that he gives us is he, he says that, man, you've got God's help in verse six. He says, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I'm gonna choose to be content. I'm gonna choose to walk in sexual purity. Again, what if a, a next step for you was that you chose to live these things out at the home level, that you chose to live out a vision that marriage is honorable, that you chose to live out that I'm gonna choose contentment over covetousness or comparison? Well, the author turns and he begins to address some other areas of how our faith plays itself out. And here's what it says in verse seven. He says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. What, he, what he's saying here is he's saying, man, look at the guys that are leading you. Look at the people that are investing in you. He, he's literally saying, look at the pastors that are in your life and see how they're living out their faith. Now, here's what you need to know about Abundant Life. This is not the, the pastors at Abundant Life are so awesome and so perfect, you should just get your act together and then live like us. Trust me, just talk to my wife. She'll tell you I'm just a man, all right? And I've got shortcomings like every other man that is here this morning and every other person that is here this morning. That the, that the staff, the pastors at Abundant Life, Pastor Phil, from, starting from the top, no one pretends that we have it all together. Like, I think we would be the first ones to say, hey, do not put us on a pedestal. If you shoot us, we will bleed, all right? We are not a superhero, all right? It's not like the Holy Spirit beckons us every morning differently than you, okay? I'm trying to just tell you, like, when I wake up in the morning, I wake up like most of y'all, like, why? Why is it so early, you know? Like, the Holy Spirit's not like, hey, buddy, why don't you come read our word together? It'll be fun. Come on. Jesus is waiting on us with coffee. Come on. Jehovah Java, he's ready, let's go. You know, that's not, that's not how it works for me, all right? I wake up just like y'all, like, why? What is this, is it still, like, what happened? You know, and, and then, like, just trying to make it, and, and none of us pretend like we're perfect. But, man, we wanna be people that you could follow. 
We wanna be people that are trying to live out our faith. And, and we do say with integrity, like Paul said, man, imitate us as we follow Jesus. And your pastoral staff, man, I, I love the people I get to work with. I love the people I get to build the kingdom of God with. And there are many people that I look to and I remember that are ruling over me like Pastor Phil, like Pastor Bart, like Pastor Mark, like Pastor Pat, these people that have gone before me and say, man, I wanna be men like them that are faithful to the work in the next season of my life. And what he's saying is you remember those people and you, you allow them to set the example, to be the pace car, and you consider the outcome of their conduct and you follow their faith. And he goes on, he says this in verse eight, another great promise from the book of Hebrews. He says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says in verse nine, so do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. He says, not with food, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. See, what was going on is that, that people in this culture, they thought if you ate certain food or you didn't eat certain food, then that made you closer to God. They're like, you know, like I go to Chick-fil-A, so I'm closer to God. I don't go to Wendy's. You know what I'm saying? Like they were saying things like that, that there was food that they were eating and that was being offered and they thought that, or, or refraining, from, refraining from, they thought that they were better. But what the author's saying is like, don't be carried away by that. That's nonsense. He says, it is good that the heart be established, not by the food you eat, not by the, the disciplines you have, but by grace. What he's saying is that the outcome of, of the leader's lives that you're following is that they understand that they're, they're saved by grace. Uh, we have these residents that we've onboarded, church planting residents and missionary residents and counseling residents that we're trying to raise up the next generation of ministers. And I'm so excited about that, getting to hang out with one of them this morning. Now imagine that I get to the end of the day and I like break down with this missionary resident that I'm hanging out with. I'm like, Mason, what did you see today? He's like, man, we were up early and we were praying and we were getting ready and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, 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 we were working hard today. You know why we were working hard? And he's like, no. And he's got his journal out. And I'm like, we were working hard today because we got to earn it, man. We got to earn it. Write that down. Earn it. And he's like, uh, earn it. Okay. Earn what? I'm like salvation. We got to work hard to earn our salvation, bro. That's what we doing. So we, we get up early. We pray. We preach. We out here grinding so that we can earn salvation. And he like puts his pen down. He's like, I don't think that's what the Bible says, right? Listen, we are not working hard for our salvation, we are working hard from our salvation. That God deserves our excellence, but it's not in our attempt to try to earn something. It's because God has given us something that we work hard from that salvation. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, man, you've been established by grace. It's not legalism in you earning this thing. You've been given this thing in Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 10, he says this, just to reiterate, double down a little bit more. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. He says, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Now, some of you, like I just lost you because you don't know Hebrew culture. You don't know Jewish culture. And, and I had to learn what this really meant. And what this guy's doing is he's borrowing familiar language for his original audience that sometimes we lose. And let me explain what he's talking about in just a second. He tries to make it clear right here. He says this in verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. What he's doing, he's connecting the sacrificial language from the Old Testament, and he's saying that that was all talking about Jesus, that Jesus was the final sacrifice, that he suffered outside the camp, just like that expiation goat, that goat of expiation had to suffer, just like that one that had to go outside the camp in order to bring people close to God, Jesus became that final sacrifice. What he's saying in a sense is that Jesus is, he's reminding us, Jesus is all you need. Jesus is a better sacrifice sacrifice and we have come to put our faith in him that Jesus suffered and died on the cross outside the camp so that we who were outside of God's camp could be brought into the camp and be brought close to God. That's what he's saying right here. In verse 13, he goes on, he says, therefore, in light of what Jesus has done, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Point number two, if you're taking notes this morning, you could write this down, next steps at church. Next steps at church. In this section, the author is inviting us to take a next step with the body of Christ. He's inviting us to take a next step within the context of the local church. And the first thing that he's doing in verses seven through 14, he's saying, man, if you wanna take a next step at the church, one of the things that you can do is learn the gospel. I mean, you can learn the gospel. I wonder, have you learned the gospel? 
I don't want to speak down on anybody because there's been people here that have been following Jesus far longer than I have, two times over. But have you learned the gospel? And I think for a lot of us, we would say, yeah, yeah, I, I know the gospel. But for all of us who, who really know the gospel, we, we understand that there's still so much more to marvel at and to learn about the gospel. That the gospel is something that, that we can learn at a, at a really elementary level, but it's also something that we must learn for the rest of our life that the gospel is something that we still have so much to learn about. And I love the gospel because it's simple enough for the simple, yet it's complex enough where it will puzzle the intelligence of the genius. And what we've just read in these last few verses is just one more layer of how we understand the gospel. And it's one of the more complex passages of scripture, but the preacher in the book of Hebrews, he's given us so many layers of understanding that Jesus is better or so many layers of understanding the gospel. And maybe for you, as a result of you coming this morning, is that you would make a new commitment to learn how to share the simple gospel, that you would learn what it means in your life, that you would respond to the gospel in your life. And then others of you that have shared the gospel a dozen times this week, and maybe some of you who have grown a little bit complacent around the gospel. For those of us that know the gospel, that maybe a next step for us is that we would be enthralled by the beauty of the gospel once again, and that we would seek to learn something new about the gospel. Again, I love the gospel. The mission at Abundant Life is to see lives changed by Jesus. And that happens when people preach the gospel. And, and I loved seeing this. I got to hear a testimony uh, this week and another one this morning about uh, one was an, an older gentleman that placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, another one was about a young, or a, a young person, a teenager that went to one week this summer and she gave her life to Jesus and Gabby is being baptized at a church house this morning. Can we give it up for Gabby? Yes. <laughs> that this teenager, man, she learned the gospel and she took a next step by being baptized. Others of you, you need to go to our evangelism training that's coming up soon so that you can learn how to articulate the gospel and you can also learn another layer of the gospel. What this author is saying is that if you wanna take a next step at church, man, learn what Jesus has done. And he goes on in verse 15, he says this, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Again, what he's saying, in light of all that Jesus has done, that he suffered outside the camp, that he became our, our savior let us respond to that by offering the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, and I love this language, the fruit of our lips. He says, giving thanks to his name. And he says, but do not forget to do good and to share for which such sacrifices God is well pleased. We're talking about taking next steps at church. And one of the things we can do is learn the gospel. Another thing that we can do is offer a sacrifice of praise. What he's saying is that in light of the gospel, let's praise God. Like we've already talked about this just a few verses before, but it's like the, the preacher, the author, he's saying, man, let me just remind you that we, we've, just, we've had our life changed by Jesus. Jesus is better and let that inform our praise and our worship. I don't know if you are getting ready or not, but we are having a worship night in about a week. And that's where we're gonna gather all campuses, church houses that can come, and we're gonna come to this location in Lee Summit and we're gonna turn the volume of our praise up a little bit. Why? Why do we do that? Well, why do we sing at church? The reason why we sing is because praise is the thing that we do in response to the work that Jesus has done. Like, like we can't pay Jesus back for our salvation. I don't know if you know that or not. It's an overwhelmingly awesome free gift. But what if our payment is just our glory in God and our gratitude for his salvation? Like I think sometimes I, like I'll, I'll, I'll get outside of myself and I'll look at myself in a worship service and I'll, and I'll ask myself, Chad, has Jesus really changed your life? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, well, your face could have fooled me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll just, like, let's, let's get it together because God can see you, bro. He can see your brow. He can see your smug. Why don't you get your worship and, and express your, your gratitude and your glory to God? What if a next step for you was that you just begin to sing and begin to praise God, that you gave him glory and you gave him gratitude? What if the next step for you at church was that you, you just simply did good and you shared with others? Again, that's what he says in verse 16 in the context of us worshiping God. He says, oh yeah, and don't forget to do good and to share. 
<laughs> this is like one of my favorite parenting verses. So if you're a parent here with young kids, remember Hebrews 13, verse 16, especially if you got multiple kids, if you got some chaos in the home, all right? I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard my wife quote this verse. Kids, do good and share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Or you're gonna get us bacon. Okay, let's just, let's just share that toy, all right? She always adds that, you know, adds that little caveat there. Do good and share, because with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Man, what a great verse for us to hear this morning. And I know with my three kids, when we're saying like, we just want y'all to get along. We just want y'all to be kind. We just want y'all to share what God has given you. Man, if God, if I feel that way about my three kids, how much more does God feel that way about us? How much more does God want us to be kind to one another, to do good to one another, and to share the things that we have? And maybe a next step for you as a result of coming this morning is that you would do good and that you would share what you have with someone else. He goes on in verse 17, and he says this. He says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. And let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. The next way that you can take a next step at the church is that you can offer your submission. You can offer your submission. Uh, the author, he is inviting us to be good church members. Now, this is a little bit awkward for me to read this and even preach on this, because it kind of feels like I'm like, hey, as one of your pastors, you need to obey and submit, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like the husband quoting those verses to his wife, you know, uh, out of Ephesians 5. Like, hey, you know what my, you know what my verse is this week, babe? Yeah, what is it? You know, uh, wives, submit to your husbands. Yeah, yeah, anytime a husband's having to quote that to his wife, you're losing, man, all right? All right, it's not going anywhere good, trust me. And so let me just kind of look at this verse from a little bit of a different angle. I know that he's saying, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. But note this, he says, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. I, mean, I don't know if you know this or not, but, but me personally, and our pastoral staff collectively, we wanna be the best pastors that we can be. But I also know this, that I fall short, and I've disappointed some of y'all before, I know that to be true, because I'm just a man. And I need Jesus just like you need Jesus. But you need to know this, and this starts from the top, Pastor Phil models this, and he leads the way, that we labor in prayer and in the word of God so that we can be the best pastors that we can be. Because we understand that we're gonna give an account to God Almighty for what we've done with the people that he's entrusted to us. Uh, there's a guy named James Harris in the city campus that God's given me the privilege of overseeing our, our downtown campus. And, and he was one of the guys, he was an early adopter. He says, I'm gonna roll with you down there. And, and um, from time to time, James, he's, he's a little bit older than me. He'll come up to me and he'll say, well, hey, uh, I'm praying for you. He's always praying for me. He said, you know, you know, you're my pastor, right? And I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, I am. He said, now, you know what that means, right? And I'm like, y yes, sir, I think so. He says, you you're watching out for my soul now. And every time he says that, I'm like, man, what a privilege, but what a pressure. And what he's doing is he's reminding me of what the Bible says a pastor should inform or should, should inform a pastor's life that when we are thinking about the church, when we're thinking about the people that God has called at Abundant Life at every church house, at every campus, man, our pastors and our church house leaders, they, they understand that we're gonna give an account for how we have led you guys and we don't take that lightly. And can we just make a deal this morning that I'll be the best, I'll try to be the best pastor I can be and we'll try to have the best pastoral staff that we can have and that you simply would try to be the best church member that you can be and you would try to bring your best. Because I think like if, if I was going off the rails, like I think that if I was doing something crazy, you'd be like, this is not right. I'm not gonna follow this guy. And so often we understand when a pastor goes off the rails and he's not doing what he's supposed to do, we can call it out. But many times we don't allow that same mirror to read us as church members. And what he's saying here is he's saying, man, offer your submission. And I love this, he says, so that it would be a joy. He says right there at the, verse, at the end of verse 17, he says, let them do so. Let them pastor you with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So maybe a next step for you this morning is that you would go through our next steps class 
where you learn about the mission and vision and values of our church. Or maybe you've been through our Next Steps class and, and you're a member at Abundant Life, but you're, just, you're kind of a wayward member. What would it look like for you to, to re-engage with the mission, vision, and values of our church so that you can be the best church member that you can be and so that we could build the kingdom of God together? He goes on, he says this in verse 18, he says, and pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. The next thing you could do in taking the next step at church is you could pray for your pastors. I love this. I love that the guy that's writing this letter is soliciting prayers. He's saying, man, we're, we're trying to be the best leaders that we can be, and, and I feel like we're, we're doing a, a, a pretty good job. He says, we're confident that we have a good conscience, but y'all, we need your prayers. And I love this because he's humble enough to ask the people that he's serving to, to say, hey, would you pray for us? Because we know that we are in a war. We know that we are under attack. And so I would just ask, would you pray for your pastors? Would you commit to praying for the, the men of God that are called to lead to this church? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but the enemy is scheming against all of us but he's especially aiming for the people that have stars on their shoulders and, and crosses, the commanders and the medics. Like how, how great would, the, would the, uh, the, the eruption in hell be if the devil took down Pastor Phil? How great would the eruption in hell be if, if the devil began to scheme in the pastoral staff at Abundant Life? And don't you know that we need your prayers and I'm asking in particular, Pastor Phil, he, he, he promoted a, a series that we're kicking off next week, but we're, we are about to call out some things that need to be called out in society. And I'm just asking that you would commit with me to pray for Pastor Phil as he prepares to preach a very, very difficult but needed sermon series coming up next week. And that we need you to pray for us as we preach against the enemies of of God, and as we preach against the soldiers of hell, we need your prayers. So maybe a next step for you this morning is that you would pray for us. He goes on, he says this, now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. Point number three, and finally, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, next steps in faith. We're talking about next steps this morning. And the author is ending the letter much the way he started. He's ending the letter with Jesus. <laughs> like I love how the Bible never gets our behavior too far removed from our belief. Like I don't know if you see this, but he's, he's trying to help us see the motivation behind our obedience. He's pointing us back to Jesus. Listen, God is calling all of us to take a next step this morning, but he's, he's not calling us to take a next step so that we could be complete. He, he's calling us to take a next step by faith that it's God working in us. This isn't a try harder and white knuckle this thing. This is a partner with the Holy Spirit and allow him to empower you as you take your next step. We have a, a, a mural that's being painted in the city. This weekend at our, at our city campus and these artists from all over our church are taking spray paint like this. And they're shaking it up and they're spraying, they're graffitiing this wall and they're making a mural that will be to the glory of God. And I love this. And when you go down to the city, check it out, it's awesome. But imagine if the artist thought that the spray paint was just gonna paint the art. Like that'd be silly, right? But, but everything in the spray paint can, there's everything in here to make something beautiful, but it's gotta be what? It's gotta be in the hands of an artist. And an artist has got to grab the spray paint, he's got to open up the can, and then he's got to spray the art on the wall. The reason why I share that with you is because what the author is saying in Hebrews is that you and I, we have everything that we need to do good and to share with others and to live out our next steps. But we have to put ourselves in the hands of God or we have to surrender our life into the hands of God because he is the artist that is painting the art on the walls of the world with our lives. And if we get that twisted, if we think that we can kind of muster up some sort of beauty in our own self, we have misunderstood our need for God Almighty. And when the mural's done, we're not gonna look back and go, wow, glory to the spray paint. No, because the glory won't be in the, the paint. The glory will be in the artist. 
in your life, when we get done at the end of our life, we're not gonna step back and go, wow, glory to you. No, you were just a spray paint can in the hands of God Almighty. You were just taking your next steps as God was applying you to this world. That's why he says here, he says that he's working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. So maybe a next step for you is by faith, you're believing that it's God working in you to paint a masterpiece for his glory on the wall of this world so that we can put the love of God on display in a really tangible way. Well, the author, he finishes with this in verse 22. He says, and I appeal to you, brethren, bear the word of exhortation for I have written to you in few words. I love that. He's like, it's just it's been a few words. Wow, the time's already out is what he's saying. All jokes aside, the book of Hebrews can be read in about an hour. But I, I believe that we will spend eternity understanding the message of Hebrews that Jesus is better. And he goes on with some formalities. He says, knowing that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he, if he comes shortly. He says, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, those from Italy greet, greet you. Grace be with you all, amen. So church, this morning, what's your next step? I've laid out for you 10 different next steps. And if you're anything like me, like you can look at this elephant of application and be like, oh my goodness, I can't do all of this. My grandpa used to remind me when I was getting a little overwhelmed with the to-do list, he would say, son, how do you eat an elephant? He'd say one bite at a time. I've laid out an elephant of application for you and I would encourage you not to be overwhelmed like you have to do all of these right now and oh my goodness. But you would simply take one application and you would apply it. We laid out connect cards in the seat backs in front of you and we also laid some out as you came in and many of you just passed right by this because you've seen this a hundred times. But I want you to grab this if you have it. And if you don't, there's one in the seat back in front of you. I want you to pull this out. This is gonna be your time of response. If you're watching us online, you can scan this QR code and this will take you to a digital connect card. So go ahead and grab that. I can see you if you haven't grabbed it yet, okay? I can't see y'all on the other campuses, but I can see y'all, all right? I want y'all to play along. This is an all skate, okay? Everybody, everybody. What I want you to do is I want you to look at this and there are about eight next steps that you can check. Now, when I get these every week, a lot of times what I'll see is that people have just like checked every box. They're like, I recently accepted Jesus. I need to be baptized. I want to attend, you know, they just go like full send, you know, like we're going to be impressed by how many boxes they check. And many times what I see is I see, man, this is somebody whose life is being overwhelmed by God and they just want to be his man or his woman. But, but realistically, man, you just need to choose one thing at a time. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab the connect card and I want you to look at these next steps. And I wanna challenge you to check one box. You can only check one. Which box are you gonna check? Do you need to accept Christ? Do you need to become a member, be baptized, be discipled? Do you need to get into community? Do you need to attend first steps so that you can check out what Abundant Life's about? Go to next steps class, or are you interested in serving? And what I would love to see happen is for many of you to take this card to the next steps desk this morning and say, you know what? I've been inspired and so I'm gonna take action because I know that my inspiration has an expiration. And if I wait until Wednesday, you know, I may not be as motivated. And so I wanna strike while the iron's hot in my heart. Others of you, you're not ready to take a next step for one reason or another, but you just need to take this card and you need to commit to pray. And I wanna challenge you to take one next step this morning as a result of coming. I wanna invite you just to bow your head and to close your eyes. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna turn it over to our campuses and give some final instructions before we uh, dismiss. So if you would bow your head and close your eyes, let's pray. Lord Jesus, 